Today we'll discuss Edward Burn Jones and look particularly at his Briar Rose series. For your reading today, you have uh, one of your more interesting readings of the semester, I think, uh, a selection from Carolyn Arscott's uh, Interlacings, where she takes very seriously um, these sort of weaving patterns, um, the interlacing threads and branches and bodies of Burne Jones' work. Last week we talked about Millet, Rossetti, and the turn from pre-Raphaelitism to aestheticism. We looked at the end of our talk at uh, Millet's The Knight Errant um, from 1870, a large painting in which the figures um, are almost life-size and which caused some consternation because of the female nude and um, uh, in its size and uh, verisimilitude. Millet's painting was a medieval subject, right? The knights, uh, the armor of which he studied at the Tower of London in his uh, characteristic detail here. Um, and the aesthetics medievalism emerged in part um, from the influence of Edward Burne Jones. Edward Burne Jones was born in Birmingham uh, in 1833. He was a painter, an illustrator, a designer, and a key figure in the second phase of pre-Raphaelitism, um, which merged into British aestheticism. In 1853, he began studying at Oxford University, intending to train for the priesthood, uh, but his interest was soon turned to art, first by William Morris, his fellow student, who we will study more in depth, and then by Dante Gabriel Rossetti, who remained a decisive influence on him. He left Oxford without taking his degree in 1856 and settled in London to forge his artistic career. I'm showing you at right Burne Jones's uh, Sidonia von Bork painting from 1860. Sidonia is the central character in Wilhelm Meingold's gothic romance, Sidonia and the Sorceress. Uh, another moment of literary and um, literary influence or sort of commingling with the visual arts um, in this group. This is a novel uh, set in 16th century Pomerania, which chronicles the crimes of the evil Sidonia, whose beauty captivates all who see her. She's shown here uh, at, court, at the court of the Dowager Duchess of Walgast, one of the early intrigues um, in a, a long uh, career of sorts that leads to her execution as a witch. So this is another, um, femme fatale figure that Burne Jones sort of mined out of literary, um, a literary reference. I'm showing you um, Sidonia, this painting of Sidonia next to uh, a painting from 1531 by Giulio Romano, uh, a Renaissance artist, because many of the details of Sidonia's appearance are taken directly from Meinhold's description, um, but the costume is derived from a portrait of Isabella d'Este by Giulio Romano, um, which uh, resided at Hampton Court. You can see, right, um, these uh, elaborate interwoven structures, right, applied um, over a um, white gauzy underdress um, repeated in Burne Jones's construction. So another sort of pre-Raphaelite obsession with um, Renaissance uh, artworks and strategies. Um, um, but it's not just the costume, right? This is the composition of the painting is repeated that um, open doorway with figures um, in the corner, the right upper right hand corner of the painting. We can also see the influence of Rossetti's red-headed beauties. Burne Jones, like Rossetti, invokes the sense of touch and smell in his painting, right, as uh, Sidonia 
uh, grasps um, uh, objects in her left hand and her necklace in her right. Smell, of course, emerges from uh, the flowers just behind her, as they do in so many of these uh, paintings. Um, we also see carried over is this interest in the femme fatale, this merging of um, death or um, danger and eroticism in aestheticism. Rossetti gave Burne Jones a few informal lessons and he attended life drawing classes for a while, but essentially he was a self-taught artist. His taste was more classical than Rossetti's, um, as you can see in his elongated forms, which owe um, quite a lot to the example of Botticelli, another, again, pre-Raphaelite uh, artist. He favored medieval and mythical subjects. He especially loved Arthurian subjects and hated such modernists as the Impressionists, describing their subjects as landscapes and whores. That's a quote. Burne Jones's own ideas about painting are sums up, summed up as follows. Quote, I mean by a picture, a beautiful romantic dream of something that never was, never will be, in light in a light better than any that have ever shown, in a land no one can define or remember, only desire and the forms divinely beautiful. In other words, realism was not the goal, right? Um, he believed as many aesthetic artists did that art could offer something different um, than existed in the real world. Burne Jones had a fairly low key career until 1877 when he became famous uh, really overnight with the showing of eight large paintings at the opening of the uh, Grosvenor Gallery. He was a friend of William Morris, um, as I said, and Rossetti, as well as John Ruskin. He designed stained glass and tapestries for William Morris's firm and was also a gifted book illustrator. Between 1864 and 1870, he worked principally in watercolor um, concentrating after this date on oil painting. In your textbook, Wilton associates the kind of gray skin we see in Burne Jones's um, painting on your right um, with a kind of dis disorientation and desolation felt by many people in Victorian Britain in the wake of Darwin's um, terrible uh, <laughs> revelations about um, evolution and uh, the threat these theories posed to Christian belief. Um, Wilton asks, if the world we know evolved slowly by chance over many millennia and men were descended from apes, was there any room for God, right? Um, so this kind of um, the art in the late 19th century um, takes on the quality of sort of ghostliness, um, uh, especially in the work of Edward Bird Jones. Uh, and we have not only this sort of grayish quality, because we know that paint can deteriorate and we sort of can't always trust digital reproductions or um, the quality of paint as we see it, but also these elongated figures with sort of pale, thin faces. Um, and sort of low, low energy figures. The subject you're seeing at right occurs in Chaucer's Legend of Good Women. Um, although Burne Jones also uh, cites Ovid's uh, Ovid um, in this work, we have Phyllis, Queen of Thrace, who falls in love with Demophoon. I may be pronouncing this wrong. Son of Theseus. He departs from Phyllis, but promises to return in six months' time. When he fails to keep his promise, Phyllis hangs herself and is turned by the gods into an almond tree, kind of in the tradition of Ovid. On his eventual return, Demophuon remorsefully embraces the tree, which blooms as Phyllis emerges to forgive and reclaim her faithless lover. Both figures are modeled on uh, one figure, Maria Zambaco, with whom Burne Jones had been having an affair since June 9, 1868. Um, there's a host of studies um, for both figures to, to prove this fact that they were both based on one model. 
And for this reason, in conjunction with uh, male nudity, a controversy ensued when it was exhibited at the Old Watercolor Society in the summer exhibition of 1870. Within two weeks of the exhibition's opening, Burne Jones withdrew the painting due to the complaints um, and uh, works by other artists were exhibited in its place. In August of 1870, Burne Jones resigned from the society over his artistic integrity. In the catalog for the summer exhibition of this, the old watercolor society, Burne Jones included the following caption, a quote from Ovid, tell me what I have done, I loved unwisely. Burne Jones later reworked the painting entirely in oils, transforming the bodies uh, of both figures into an homage to Michelangelo, calling it instead the Tree of Forgiveness, where Zambaco's face remains only on Phyllis, and the two figures look more distinct from each other. Here you can see uh, just how closely Burne Jones referenced Sandro Botticelli. Um, I'm showing you Botticelli's Primavera, just a, a cropped detail on the left, and uh, next to Burne Jones's work. Um, you can see in Primavera, there's a nymph who is being raped by the wind um, on the very right side of the painting. In Burne Jones's picture, uh, this is reversed. The genders here are reversed. It's Phyllis um, that's seizing the male figure. So there are lots of reversals, um, but um, a particular mode is invoked here. Um, a reference um, to a pre-Raphaelite painter is made um, explicitly and in a way that viewers would have recognized. Um, and this, this sense of both sort of gender conflation and gender reversal um, is fairly typical of the aestheticists' uh, play. Um, as I mentioned in our last meeting, the sense of um, effeminate, um, all of this is in air quotations, effeminate men and sort of um, masculine women, this play on gender norms um, was really part of the aestheticist uh, uh, mode of figuration and, and their sort of broader challenge to norms. This is an image of Grosvenor Gallery, um, a site uh, of aestheticist um, exhibition in the 1870s and 1880s. This gallery opened in May 1877, founded by Sir Lindsay and his wife as an exhibition space for especially large-scale aestheticist and French painting. The Grosvenor Gallery um, was intended to be an alternative public gallery um, to the Royal Academy, so showing works that the Royal Academy would not necessarily have approved of or that faced criticism in that context. Um, and the gallery was also framed um, more as a kind of total aesthetic environment. Um, it's not as clear in this image, but um, there was often antique furniture brought in, oriental rugs, exotic flowers, decorative statues, in addition to the painting. So this that would not have taken place in the uh, Royal Academy exhibition context. And you can see in this caricature the kind of newness, right, a bird just hatched, um, challenging, uh, as a little art paradise, challenging the peacocking a Royal Academy with it, all of its um, older men uh, jurying um, the sort of uh, main monolithic institution. So Burne Jones became famous overnight after the exhibition of this painting at Grosvenor Gallery. It's a tale from an Arthurian legend where Merlin, who was infatuated with um, Nimue, um, was bewitched. Um, so we're seeing a love-struck wizard and a seductress. Again, this femme fatale character um, coming up. We see in this work Burne Jones's calligraphic use of line, his long-limbed bodies, so these serpentine branches, serpentine bodies, right? Nothing is um, quite so vertical um, 
uh, no line is uh, quite as straight as one would see in those classicized images, right? You can hardly imagine a, uh, a column here. And there is, um, from the Pre-Raphaelite movement, and it a careful attention to the folds of drapery, to uh, precise description of the flowers here. But unlike pre-Raphaelite paintings proper, um, this is an overtly seductive painting. Burne Jones is striving for elegance and formal beauty. Um, he's using very soft tones, right? Not that crystalline light we saw in the pre-Raphaelite paintings. And uh, this is, quite an opposite message to remember the moral awakening that we study. This is not um, opposed to uh, seduction and amorous encounters, um, but really celebrating those, uh, those pairings and twinnings. The theme of seduction was a refrain in Burne Jones's work for more than 15 years. When, in June of 1860, he married Georgiana MacDonald, the couple received as a wedding gift a small upright piano, on the inside lid of which he painted a vignette showing an angel working on the bellows of a portable organ. In 1868, Burne Jones signaled his intention to begin uh, the present work, which he continued to work on in 1871 and 1873, uh, and completed in 1877, uh, showing it in 1878. Um, this is a long project. Its critical reception was mixed. For Henry James, the love song resembled some mellow Giorgione or some richly glowing Titian and was a brilliant success in the way of color. By contrast, the critic W.H. Malick reacted against the picture's latent sexuality, finding the figure of the woman the, quote, languor of exhausted animalism. At the time of the Grosvenor Gallery show, or shortly thereafter, it seems likely that Burne Jones prepared the beautiful graphite replica that bears his monogram. Um, to Joseph Komen Carr, a friend, critic, and the co-director of the Grosvenor Gallery, showing the importance of this work. For Burne Jones and uh, his circle, Chant d'Amour is a key picture in which the romantic medievalism is suffused with a dewy pastoral warmth emanating uh, again from Renaissance Venice. The traditions of Manuscript illumination merge with the influences of Botticelli and Titian. And again, for the aestheticists, music would be a key theme. Um, music in their minds was a pure art, uh, non-representational, sort of inherently abstract, at least according to them. Um, music was the embodiment of art for art's sake. Um, so music emerges again and again in works like this, um, as does uh, seduction. Burne Jones's painting of the African king Copueta and his love for the beggar Pen Penelophon, sorry guys, these names, was based on an Elizabethan ballad and Tennyson's poem, The Beggar Maid. So another literary reference here, um, which should be quite familiar to you. The painting became famous for its technical execution and the theme of love and beauty transcending power, class, and material wealth. It was regarded as one of the finest paintings ever produced by a British artist and was widely admired in Europe. The egalitarian story has also been connected with the socialism of Edward Burne Jones's close friend, William Morris, who again will examine in closer detail in a future meeting. Burne Jones had been a force to reckon with in Paris since the exhibition of The Beguiling of Merlin and Love Among the Ruins at the Universal Exposition in 1878. His reputation reached a new height with the exhibition of this painting from uh, at the 1884 at the Universal Exposition where he was awarded the Legion of Honor. And I should say that the Universal Exhibitions in Paris were really um, 
monumental affairs. There are many art historical books written about these. This is the sort of World's Fair um, uh, art industry um, being exhibited on a grand scale. So for Burne Jones to make a splash in, at an event like this in France was quite a big deal. And what we're seeing is a picture of a waif-like waif -like beggar um, enchanting a monarch with her wan beauty, um, which would really uh, strike quite a, a, a note in France, especially um, with the kind of aesthetic and interests of the French symbolist movement. The symbolists were interested in particular in the archaism, the that deliberate reference to um, to the past um, and to stylistic tendencies of uh, medieval and Renaissance examples, and also the motif again of the femme fatale, um, that sort of dangerous woman. Significantly, the award of the Legion of Honor was campaigned for by the French symbolists Pouvi de Chavan and Gustave Moreau. Burne Jones's growing popularity with symbolists was the basis of his success in France. And with the decline of interest in symbolism around 1900, the French interest in Burne Jones also abated. And his reputation as this kind of internationally famous artist wasn't really recovered until the 1960s. And here I'm just showing you very briefly the work of the French symbolist Gustave Moreau, um, where we see the dance of Salome, a, another image of a femme fatale, a murderous, um, in fact, woman um, who is either haunted by the ghost of um, the man she assassinated um, or uh, is sort of dancing around it. Um, so seduction and uh, violence are wrapped up in the figure of the femme fatale here. We'll now move our focus to Burne Jones's uh, enormously influential Briar Rose series. Between 1874 and 1884, Burne Jones painted four large panels inspired by Charles Perrault's uh, Tale of the Sleeping Beauty. The subject was first developed um, 10 years before for the Surrey home of a painter, Miles Burkett Foster. The four large pictures that compose the final version, so the fruit of really 20 years work, were eventually exhibited in 1890 at Agnew's Bond Street Gallery, and thousands of people lined up um, in London to see them. It is said that enthusiasm amounting to ecstasy took the place of the depreciation which Burne Jones had uh, become quite accustomed to um, for so long. Um, so you see um, one of these eight foot long paintings on the bottom of your screen and the interior um, that they were uh, created for on the top. And the images aren't fabulous of all of these, um, but um, they're, they're fairly, I found some fairly good reproductions. Um, so the final series had always been intended for use as decorations to decorate an interior space. Remember the aestheticist um, embrace of the decorative arts, of the sort of intersection between the arts. Um, and so they were meant to be installed in the uh, house of the first Lord Farringdon, uh, Mr. Alexander Henderson, uh, for his drawing room at Buskett. When Burne Jones visited the house soon after they were installed, um, their setting didn't quite satisfy him. So he designed a framework of carved and gilt wood. We remember this practice from the Pre-Raphaelites. Um, and to unify the four long paintings, he also painted narrow panels um, in between them that continue this, this rose motif, this kind of floral motif. The series is drawn from the northern fairy tale of Sleeping Beauty, uh, featuring a princess and her court frozen in time in this 
medieval dream world. Um, you all are probably familiar with the fairy tale of Sleeping Beauty. Um, this is the story of a princess and her court who have fallen under a spell and are uh, have been sleeping for a hundred years. Um, they're only released from this slumber um, when the princess is kissed. Um, but Byrne Jones decides not to depict the act of the kiss, but instead separate the knight, which we'll see on the next slide, from the princess um, over the course of these four paintings. So we see the knight entering the scene and then um, the princess on, in the last painting um, waiting for him. So this is the, we're seeing the court when they're still uh, caught in this um, sort of magical, uh, terrible slumber. Um, the princess, I should mention, is modeled on Burne Jones's own daughter, Margaret, and is, uh, is surrounded by attendants. We see this, the court kind of laid out as they, they wait for the prince to wake her. Here I'm showing you one of those photogravures um, of the knight entering the uh, briar patch, and you can see what incredible quality this kind of reproduction, again, at one third the size offered. In this introductory scene, the armored hero, the knight, cuts his way through the briars, um, which figure so prominently um, in Byrne Jones's interpretation of the story, to discover five slumbering knights who failed to break the curse that binds the princess. So these are, uh, this is, you know, like the proverbial knight entering the dragon's lair and seeing the kind of skeletons of the knights that have come before him. So these are knights that have failed to break this curse. William Morris, a close friend of Burne Jones, um, and of course a collaborator in pre raphaelitism second wave, um, this aestheticist movement, composed the verse on the painting's frame, uh, which you can't see here uh, because we've kind of zoomed in on the painting itself. But what Morris writes, the fateful slumber floats and flows about the tangle of the rose, but lo the faded hand and heart to rend the slumberous curse apart. So kind of uh, embracing poetry and this medievalism. Uh, the strange part about the representation of this story by Burne Jones um, is that he really relegates the figure of the armored knight, this hero, to the margins. Um, think about this as a very kind of left left hand side bookend, not only to this eight foot long painting, but to the four paintings um, together. And uh, the thing that takes the kind of central position is the rose plant itself, this plant that has grown up in the hundred years um, that this curse has been active. So the series is really organic, um, as you read, and it evokes the grafting together of living forms. There's this really um, powerful tangle. Uh, skin is evoked. Um, uh, you read R. Scott argue when the knight presents the armor. This makes us conscious that armor serves as a, a more or less effective sheathing of vulnerable inner parts, again, kind of acting like this dermis or skin. The materials that make up suits of armor sometimes appear flexible or sometimes brittle. In 1866, so not long before the series was made, Thomas Huxley relied on microscopic studies to identify the layers of skin, this kind of layered substance with a scaly epidermis on top and a gelatinous dermis below. You may have seen um, uh, microscopic images of skin, you know, in science classes before, but this was a new discovery. The 19th century was, you know, when we, when um, uh, microscopes uh, became um, sort of in frequent use. So this may have been a fascination for Burne Jones, um, the art historian believed. Um, and he returns again and again to um, the armored figure, investigating this relationship between uh, skin and armor, right? Exterior and uh, vulnerable interior. And he also is investigating this 
uh, conjoining of dissimilar materials, the organic and the inorganic, uh, the human and uh, flora here. So a really sort of complex interweaving of elements um, in this painting series, investigating more than just the Sleeping Beauty uh, story. R. Scott argues that this um, interest between armor and skin is also at play in Burne Jones's painting Saint of St. George um, from 1873 to 1877. Uh, Wan and weary, St. George turns his eyes to his right and seems to lean on um, his standard for support. Uh, of course, a uh, the famous dragon slayer, uh, the dragon appears in a slick heap behind St. George's legs, but seems sort of beyond the point here. Um, there's a, another sense of sort of sleepiness at work. Um, St. George has expanded pupils and drooping eyelids. There's a sort of vacuity, trembling lips. He appears weakened and emasculated. Um, this is a really puzzling image. Um, and part of the puzzle is this um, a naked figure on the uh, shield uh, as part of the armor of St. George, um, as if, you know, this armored figure is sort of turned inside out um, on the surface of the shield. Um, it's a strange body, uh, illegible, fleshly, irregular, um, a, an unclothed woman. Um, so it sets up the series of contrasts in this painting, male and female, hero, monster, surface, and interior, um, jointed surface, right? The sort of metallic surface and stretchy um, skin. Flesh is juxtaposed and conjoined with armor on the shield, right? Um, as it appears on the shield. Um, so we have some similar themes and we can pick up on these, this pleasure in opposites um, and the setting skin against uh, armor and metal in the Briar Rose series. This gives us some insights. When the series was exhibited for the second time in 1891 on the east end of London, it was given a descriptive pamphlet specially devised to make the panels accessible to the working class audience who were admitted for free. The series, as you can see, is designed very much like a tapestry, organized in simple planes with legible narratives. And it's based, um, as we said, on 17th century fairy tales um, of Perrault, uh, but also interwoven with Grimm's tales that uh, those were written between 1812 and 1815, and Tennyson's poem, The Daydream, from 1842. Burne Jones does not show the dead growth of hair in the palace the way Tennyson described it, the horrific extension of hair over those hundred years. Instead, the growth of the briar hedge invades the palace, standing in for the extension of the dermis and the passage of time. The thorny hedge, uh, as you can see in this panel, thrusts itself around the structures and the figures and the composition. Creeping stems insinuate themselves around pillars and beneath curtains. You see these vines growing into the bedchamber from all directions around the bed. There's a kind of violent upheaval as it lifts a slab of brick floor in the kitchen. The briar probes the joints of the mosaic pavement. It creeps between the limbs of the sleeping servant maids and grows thick and thorny along the tender skin of sleeping courtiers. Back to the first panel. In the thicket outside the castle, knights who have heard of the legend and come to rescue the sleeping princess have fallen into slumber. The briar grows around these questing figures turning into their armor, snagging shields and raising them up. Everywhere, Briar dislodges and disarranges uh, previously ordered elements. The 
The long narrative of the four canvases ends in the princess's chamber, the briar puncturing, refusing to respect protective boundaries around the princess, uh, a kind of stand-in for or uh, showing anxieties about the breaching of the princess's virginity. The sleeping figure, we worry about her as the thorns threaten to puncture her skin. In the mid-1890s, publications about British art in France uh, changed their preference or their mood uh, from artists like Edward Byrne Jones to Aubrey Beardsley. British art in their minds was seductive, but the French believed it was dangerous to look backwards. They didn't embrace the kind of medievalism we see in Burne Jones's work anymore um, and wanted instead to look forward um, as the century came to a close. Aubrey was uh, admired for his daring use of black and white and seemed to exemplify um, the kind of dead-ended decadence, that art for art's sake taken to an even more decorative and erotic extreme. Here we see Beardsley uh, illustrating for Oscar Wilde's book, uh, Salome. Um, uh, in particular here, the scene where Salome kisses the decapitated head of John the Baptist. Remember, we saw Salome dancing in Gustave Moreau's painting before. This was a really um, popular subject around the decadent turn of the century. In Beardsley's hands, he combines a kind of exquisite formal elegance with brutality and blood and death, right? What is that sort of black liquid pooling um, the, on the bottom half of the page? It's, it's beautiful and disturbing, um, something really praised by symbolist artists. Burne Jones's painting, The Golden Stairs from 1880, epitomizes the artist's interest in investigating a mood rather than telling a legible story. He deliberately made many of his paintings enigmatic, and uh, the meaning of this painting in particular has provoked much debate. One view is that these are, uh, these 18 women are spirits occupying a kind of enchanted dream. The painting may also be purely decorative, con conveying instead uh, the idea of endless movement. There was uh, also an idea that's been linked with this painting um, by the critic Walter Pater in the 1870s that all art uh, constantly aspires to the condition of music, so perhaps the rhythm of these figures is more to the point, giving visual form to the qualities of music. Burne Jones acquired huge frame, fame and prestige, not only in Britain, but also on the continent. Remember, he had considerable influence on the French symbolists. Um, and the ethereally beautiful women who people his paintings, like the more sensuous women we saw in Rossetti's paintings, had many imitators at the end of the century, um, just as we saw with Beardsley. Although Burne Jones was lauded for the, his poetic qualities by many critics, some thought his pictures morbid and unmanly. Again, these sort of gender norms um, emerge in the criticism of uh, aestheticist paintings. And Burne Jones paintings do tend to be flat and freeze-like in composition, right? Uh, look at the Golden Stairs. Um, and he favored richly textured surfaces. His feeling for pattern was put to good use uh, in his work as a designer. Remember, he was a founding member of William Morris's Decorative Arts Company in 1861 and designed some outstanding stained glass and tapestries uh, for that outfit, as well as making illustrations for, uh, for books. Burne Jones's reputation crumbled after his death and did not seriously revive until the 1960s. To wrap up, we see Burne Jones carrying over from pre raphaelitism the use of medieval and Renaissance examples and uh, engaging 
literary sources uh, in his artwork. His aestheticism, however, departs from the pre-Raphaelites in its uh, valuation of sensuality over morality. Burne Jones, as well, celebrates the decorative, um, and we see this in the two examples I have on your screen. Remember that aestheticism favored art for art's sake, that art is meant to contribute beauty to the world and not offer a kind of didactic moral message that was the driving force of a lot of academic painting. Think about history painting. Think about Angelica Kaufman's right tales from uh, history, those moral messages. Um, nor does he offer or is interested in portraits celebrating his contemporaries. And we need to see this backwards turn, right, this turn to the medieval, to the Venetian Renaissance, as having a kind of ethical position. It may seem strange, but this is a rejection of the rules of the Royal Academy um, that should be familiar to you over the last couple of weeks. So too was the femme fatale figure and these ephebic, um, effeminate men in aestheticist paintings. These figures offered a challenge to, or an alternative to, the rigid gender norms we saw at play in those 18th and 19th century portraits. Instead of strict binaries, man, woman, public, private, Burne Jones offers interlacings. Uh, facets woven together, thorns eating away at previously rigid structures.